Okay, Ryan, how are you? Ryan Gill from Hunt Primitive. Uh, doing pretty good. How you doing? Pretty good. Yeah, um, <laughs> it's been a kind of interesting week at school. You can imagine. I'm sure your your boys are experiencing that the week before Christmas. Oh yeah, absolutely. They're excited. Yeah. Oh yeah. Of course they are. <laughs> even even Dalton. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep, every, every day, how many more days? Yeah. Yeah. The teachers are thinking the same thing, like, oh my gosh, should I show a video? Should I teach an actual class? Like, it's just getting rough, but uh, yeah. we'll survive. Anyway, um, so Hunt Primitive, you want to talk, maybe just inter do a basic introduction of, uh, of yourself and uh, a little bit about Hunt Primitive, if you would. Oh, I imagine most people, if they're watching this, they probably already know or listening to this. Nope. Um, but yeah, <laughs> I'm Ryan Gill uh, from Hunt Primitive where we entertain, educate, and inspire. And basically what Hunt Primitive does is uh, both give content to educate people, of course, and entertain uh, about primitive hunting. But then of course, we also make products to sell to people, bows, arrows, that little stone points, all that kind of stuff. So uh, kind of a, a full circle outfit, you know, where everything from products to how to's to inspirational videos to get folks interested in hunting primitive. The, um, the videos themselves, um, what do you, it's really taken off in the last few years. What do you, what do you think, what do you think is, is giving you the most bump in that area? Is it, is it the teaching? Is it the, just the, the content, the hunting content, the teaching aspect? What do you think? I think it's the teaching overall. I mean, you know, people like to, to watch some of the hunts for sure but at the end of the day a lot of people get on because they want to learn how to do this kind of stuff themselves so it's like i'm trying to teach them how to do it themselves and you know if they gain some value off the video you know they they tend to recognize my name and then they'll come back and you know watch the hunting videos and stuff like that too so it's hard to say i mean i'm certainly not a a giant youtube channel you know relatively small i suppose in the grand scheme of things um, but you know, I'm not really into it for the shock and awe factor. I'm, I'm more boring. I'm in it for the education, <laughs> you know, nobody yeah. likes to learn if they're forced to learn, you know, but they try to keep it fun, but yeah, for sure. So, um, did you think, um, just looking back, like say in high school, did you think, could you ever imagine you'd be making your living doing this? Maybe not this specifically, but I remember doing the going, outdoors, you think? Or? Yeah, I mean, we used to do job fairs and all kinds of stuff. And there was a, a whole, like every teacher that when we had to do like a job report or something like that, um, I picked something that I just wanted to do. And they always told me, well, that's not a real job. And I always got a bad grade on it <clears throat> um, because it, you know, wasn't, you know, being a, a lawyer or, uh, being a funeral director or just you know some shit like that it's hard to <laughs> yeah you know that your normal your normal people jobs you know yeah and nine to course, five 40 yeah. hour week work week and i didn't understand the word entrepreneur at that time and, and it probably wasn't uh overly popular either uh so you know the idea of just making up something that you want to do and then running with it because you're passionate about it didn't really exist in that realm i mean obviously it did exist in the real world but not in school they tell you you can't do that and so i would get bad grades and you know for a while i remember being like 14 maybe and i wanted to be a government trapper you know i wanted to be able to trap because mm -hmm. i love the idea you know of going out and running trap lines and stuff like that but you know come to the conclusion that fur prices are low and there's no real money in that and it's like well if you have problem animals you know the the government, you know, hires people to come trap them. And so that sounded like a, a pretty good idea to me. Now, now I'm glad I don't do it because I, you know, didn't go that route because I don't want to work for the government. I wouldn't make any money. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, <laughs> and then I would steady, be a steady uh, paycheck, but low paycheck. <laughs> maybe. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And uh, so, but yeah, I always, I always had a feeling I was just going to do something, you know, along these lines, but never any clue what it would ever be mm -hmm. and then just as a general question i just thought of this while you were talking you see yourself more as a if you had to pick one but you don't of course but um is it more as a hunter builder um filmmaker or or more as an entrepreneur 
all of the above less of a filmmaker that's probably the lowest one okay you know started off i would say hunting came first then building and then business um film is still pretty low on the scale i don't consider myself a filmmaker by any stretch of the imagination Mm -hmm. i just film out of necessity um but you know now even though it started with hunting and then moved to building and then into business now like it's almost started to flip around the other way a little bit um to where now i'm starting to have a little bit more focus on the business where there for a while it was more focused on the building you know then the hunting and then business and you know they flop around if you wanted to put them into one two three order but uh i would say now it's probably more business honestly it can reach a lot more people and um can inspire a lot more people if you have if you have a little bit of the funds to do it you can actually you know help and inspire more people in the long run so it's not a bad goal and um you got it's at least even right now it's kind of a family business right your your wife helps she's joined the team maybe a year ago or so i'm not sure yeah it's been over a year ago now but yeah th- she's uh she's full time uh, used to say working for me, but that's not really the case. She really works with me now. So I, it's hard. I could really couldn't do um, to the capacity that we're doing now without her. Um, she handles all the order intake and then outgoing printing, shipping labels, boxing and shipping, scheduling shipping, um, dealing with a lot of customers just that have questions about stuff. She answers the phone. She, she takes care of everything outside of shooting the animals and uh creating a video and building the product but everything else is pretty much her at this point she does even even does all the bookkeeping and stuff now so quite indispensable yeah for sure and then you you think um we talked about this recently but maybe down the line your boy is getting involved in some capacity they're a little young now but maybe yeah that's that's kind of the goal they both say that they want to do it you know of course that change it can change as you get older but you know, I just kind of molding them into the end of the family business. And I think that they do want to do it. They see the freedom that, uh, that my wife and I have compared to some of their other friends and stuff whose parents go to work. And none of that looks like a lot of fun to them. I think they actually like what I do. And, uh, yeah, if ideally, you know, we get to the point where they can, uh, they can take over a lot of the building and, and, uh, even filmmaking and that kind of stuff. And then I can just kind of work to support them, And, you know, really, hopefully, you know, they grow up and get married and, you know, their wives become a part of it and they do, their wives do the job that Kelly does. That would be ideal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. And um, my wife, I was asking Mary Lucy, also known as Marcy Lisa, for some ideas for questions and she had a good one. Um, what, What is your favorite, if you had to choose a product or just even for yourself, um, to make like in terms of a primitive product, you know, a napped head or a, or a prim a self bow or whatever, what do you, a quiver? What do you think? What's your favorite to make? Couldn't, couldn't choose one. Really? Is it, do you have yeah. a, one that you, you're not crazy about? Uh, whichever one I probably did 10 of them last. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, I run in cycles. So instead of, I don't typically not, it, it depends on how, how quick an order needs to go out, but I typically don't bounce around from one thing to the next. So I do do stuff in batches. Like if I've got bows to work on, I try to do a lot of bow work in several days straight. And when I have to do arrows, I will fill every arrow order that I have from, you know, if it takes a few days to just do that sheer amount of arrows, that's what I do. If it's stone points, I sit down for the day and that's what we do, you Mm -hmm. know, knives. So I just run in those batches. And then by the time I'm done with that batch, I've completely had enough of it. I never want to see another one again until next week. And then I'm happy to have that one back because I'm tired of doing whatever I did last. (laughs) But if I bounce around to too many different things, I'm not as productive. So I try to do everything all kind of at once. You know, and I saw your workshop, well, we really have two of them, but a couple weeks ago, I noticed these whiteboards. Um, You want to talk a little bit about that or you want to keep that to yourself? Like the the (laughs) the ideas, uh, inspiration, et cetera. Yeah, no, that's fine. So yeah, I always wanted a whiteboard in a shop and then we got, you know, kind of a great big one. That's, I think it's four by six or something like that. Pretty, pretty good size. And then after having that one, um, 
it it came really quick to where I was like, yeah, I need another one. <laughs> and I think the, the second one's a three by four. And I've had those things absolutely completely full to where there's no real estate left on the whiteboards. And it's, it's everything for, I have one that I primarily use for like business more oriented stuff. And then one that I use for either data for the book, you know, specific order things that I need to write typically all the order stuffs on on tickets that we have in the shop like on index cards um, but if there's something in particular but it's just like as soon as something pops into my head I've learned to write it down because otherwise it's in and out and I'll probably think about it again but I need to be able to log whatever it is I'm thinking about and I've realized if I put it in a notebook I'll never open the notebook to look if it's on the whiteboard I kind of have to look at it because I want that real estate back. And so I have to complete that job or I have to make a decision is whatever I wrote on the whiteboard important enough to keep on the whiteboard or do something with, if it was an idea that sounded awesome at the time and it wasn't very good a week later, I'll erase it. Um, and if it's something I'm really passionate about, I make sure I complete it before I erase it. And then, uh, you know, I always look forward to the, when I finally get to where I can actually clean the whiteboard off and start over. But yeah, I'm constantly just writing stuff on it. It's every day. It's every single, especially with data, with the new book that I'm working on. It's, it's full again. I just cleared, cleared the dang thing off a <laughs> week ago. And now it's completely full of data again, from moisture tests on bows to, you know, with feet per second, you know, depending on how much humidity a bow soaks up, um, you know, ambient humidity, how that affects the, the performance, the feet per second performance that the bow shoots the arrow. Um, all that kind of stuff and that's ongoing like constantly i'm trying to test new things to establish patterns and learn as much about it as i possibly can i think i've got a pretty good handle on it at this point but you know anytime i get to test a little bit more we just do it i want the yeah, book to be the best it can be do you have a working title for the for the book yeah but i'm not saying it okay all right <laughs> <laughs> yeah that, i'm excited to release all of that um, you know, got a, got a big project coming up as, as you know, you're going to be involved in it, but I'm not uh, telling anybody what that is either. And it's all going to gotcha. kind of, it's going to be one big culmination when the book is ready and the projects are done, it's going to be, this is all out and available right now. And so it'll be kind of like, uh, nobody ever saw the whole business come until it's totally out and done. Getting back to the, um, this is kind of a weird segue, but as usual for my podcast, but um, do, you, do you see the, the whole whiteboard thing as being a benefit to people in general? I mean, I know people have been doing like, you know, uh, notebooks, like I have a, I have a, like a legal notepad right next to me. Do you think mm -hmm. it makes a difference to actually have it in your face like that, like haunting you like on a big board, <laughs> like address yeah, me does. now you know yeah it does to me it makes a big difference i think that's a a solid piece of my productivity now is is that whiteboard and yeah now that i've got it i'll never go back to not having one again mm -hmm. so I've always wanted it just you know not just originally i wanted it because i wanted to use it in videos to be able to stand in front of it and pontificate um, for the most part on videos, you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't want to be able to lecture and then have data and stuff behind me, you know, to be able to teach people stuff. Um, but you know, now it's, uh, it's turned into so much more than that. And, uh, much like any great tool, once I've got it, I can't, uh, I can't imagine living without it now. It's just, yeah, it's know. a part of it. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. And, um, Getting back to the beginnings, did you have a hunting mentor? Like just as it not just a general hunting mentor? Was it your father or did you family or yeah, my dad primarily, without a doubt. And he wasn't he wasn't into primitive hunting at all. He he liked traditional archery. He he shot a lot, but he didn't didn't kill a lot of animals with it. And uh, he was excited that I liked it, but figured that I would just kind of follow in the same footsteps and shoot you know, a bear recurve and not really kill much, but just enjoy it. And, uh, you know, shoot, I wish you could see where I'm at at this point now. Cause you yeah. wouldn't even be able to believe it. <laughs> Unbelievable. Yeah, for sure. And then did you have, um, like what, when did the primitive skills come in? Was that something around the same time or as a kid, have you always been fascinated with, with primitive cultures or native Americans or like, when did that 
When did the switch happen, give or take? Pretty young. Um, you know, especially going to the traditional bow hunters in Florida shoot, you know, when I was maybe seven or eight years old, like, oh, I had an interest in that kind of stuff beforehand. I mean, I grew up as young, about as young as I can remember watching like the old Davy Crockett movies and, you know, that kind of stuff that just, just puts that kind of woodsman spirit in you, you know, and loved Westerns growing up. And so you constantly cowboys and Indians. Um, but yeah, we'd go to traditional bow hunters of Florida shoots and see the guys in the primitive classes, you know, some of them were wearing, you know, brain tan clothes and wearing or and shooting stick bows. And, you know, just to me, I was like, man, that's, that seems like that's the top. That's what I really, really want to do, you know? And, uh, yeah, it's just been kind of full throttle ever since then. You know, I just kept getting further and further away from any modern stuff and just getting, you know, as deep as I can into the primitive. And I mean, it, it, I even when I say I can't get any more primitive than I am now, I'm constantly finding a new way to make it, you know, more challenging, but also more contextual. So it's like, I, you know, even getting rid of like a couple years ago, especially getting rid of the modern strings on my personal bows like obviously when i build bows for customers we use modern strings not everybody's ready to make that jump but when you completely give up shooting you know dacron strings and you're going straight to sinews bow strings and that's all you know or plant fiber or whatever and that's the only thing you're shooting it, it's kind of uh you know it's it's a big jump like similar it doesn't get as much glory is uh jumping from stone points to steel points or from steel points to stone points sorry um, you know, but it's really just as much of a learning curve is as leaving modern conventional, you know, glue on broadheads and going on to a, a hafted stone point. Like that's a big, you know, kind of culture shock, if you will, when, you, when it comes to hunting. And it's the same thing whenever you ditch the modern strings and you literally go on a hunt and don't even bring a modern string with you you know and all that's progressional you know you make a string just like it was when I was starting to hunt with stone that I would always keep you know a stone pointed or a steel pointed arrow in my quiver you know just in case something happened I, I had a safety net you know if I really wanted to switch I could do it and then, until you realize I don't need to have that anymore and then you stop carrying this the steel points and there for a while when I was really getting into the primitive strings I would still you know ball up a dacron string that fit my bow and I would you know stuff it in the pocket of my quiver or something and then just realize that I didn't need it anymore and then I replaced the dacron string with another sinew string so i have a backup you know always got a spare bow string and uh, the, i've yet to really break through a sinew string but they're extremely tough but you know it's always good to just have an extra string especially if you're taking a big trip somewhere but you know once you have confidence that you can get it done with that i mean it, people say well what's the big deal and this the string that you shoot but a sinew bow string is you know robs a lot of performance off of the off the bow itself that uh you know even compared to dacron i mean you're looking at about a 10 feet per second difference on between sinew and dacron and what, if, what about like plant fibers like yucca or something like that it's it's virtually the same as is sinew okay and sinew's stronger so yeah we i've done quite a bit of testing on that and a lot of people say oh well you have you know no it doesn't have as much stretch or it doesn't have you know to worry about humidity and humidity doesn't seem to affect the sinew string as much as everybody seems to think um but otherwise it does have some stretch because all all cordage has some amount of stretch mm -hmm. to it but the trade-off is the plant fiber can't hold as much uh, tension is the sinew so you end up making a fatter string so where they're like oh well it's lighter it doesn't stretch you end up having a fatter string to hold the you know the real tension of a, of a true hunting bow uh, so you know sinew string can be almost half as thick as a, as a yucca string or a or a nettle string or something like that and uh, not only that but the the plant fiber strings all have an expiration date they cut themselves you know, as you mm. shoot, and they they abrade uh, uh, abrade themselves basically wherever you tie a knot, and it doesn't seem to matter what kind of knot you tie. It doesn't even have to be a real knot. I've done just a figure eight loop around the bottom, and then with like a stop knot to where 
it's not even a knot. It's just kind of figure eight around itself and it'll still anywhere that it moves it'll slowly cut itself and so that might that might take place in uh you know in 50 shots or it might take place in 200 shots but it's gonna break and as you kind of look at it you'll see it's starting to cut and there's not much you and i've tried to grease it you know wax it do everything i can to cut down that, that abrasion it cuts itself just about no matter what but sinew without a doubt, the best primitive bowstring material I've used. And I have yet to have one cut itself. I'm still shooting some of the same ones that I built originally. Wow. And that sinew that you've harvested from deer or game? Yeah, some of it. Of course, I mean, I use so much sinew now that oh, yeah. with the with the business, I mean, I buy it in bulk from places that mm -hmm. are, you know, animal processors and stuff, because it's not uncommon for me to run through, you know, two, 300 strips of sinew and a year you know without wow. i mean that's probably very conservative <laughs> actually wow. you know probably several you know more hundred than that mm -hmm. um but yeah we use it between arrows and strings and you know hafting points fletchings that kind of stuff plus we sell the sinew strips as well so yeah we run through a lot of sinew mm -hmm. and then uh if you had to choose um like your go-to bow for pigs or for deer for florida hunting say um what, what would it be like what's your favorite do you have a favorite do you um like in terms of wood um just the whole setup what would you think let's geek out a little bit wood for sure osage um osage okay i thought i was i was feeling pretty good about you know some of the white woods for a while and was doing a lot of experiment with that and i was really convinced that that i could make uh the white woods perform as, as good as Osage and you can, if it comes down to a moisture issue. You have to constantly keep um, any sort of white wood to a very, very low moisture content for it to perform well. And if you're not constantly babysitting it and putting it either in a hot box or drying it by a fire, it gains that moisture and it loses a significant amount of performance. And that that pretty much goes for any white wood in any way you do it. You can heat temper the belly, you know, fire harden it, kiln dry it, anything you want to do, even putting finishes on it, like very heavy finishes, thick finishes, the humidity will find its way in and there's no cure for it. Um, I've done a phenomenal amount of testing with that, like for the new book. That's the one thing I was really trying to crack the code on that and say, is there a way that we can mitigate moisture content so we can have a, a really high performing white wood bow, so, you know, like a, specifically a hickory bow because it's, you know, so native to the east. Um, I really wanted to be able to use that. And of course, I've got so much more information in the book that's going to be about that. You can't even really cover it all here. I mean, that chapter alone is, is, I don't know, probably 30 to 40 pages. It's, it's a ridiculous amount of, of information, mm -hmm. data charts, and, um, you know, just practical application testing. It's, it's a little bit too much, honestly, it's insane, but I wanted to make sure I covered all the bases on that. Um, but I do honestly believe, especially by the Mississippian time period, you know, a little bit later, you know, say a thousand years ago, um, Osage trade routes were really well developed. I mean, people were traveling from, um, you know, Florida with goods all the way up to the Cahokia Mounds. So, I mean, you've got people that was like a central hub, you know, that's now that's before a little bit before that yet, but still in Mississippi in times. Um, but uh, you had people coming from all over the continent to that central hub and trading goods as they've got uh, artifacts there from, you know, made out of shells from Florida to, you know, obsidian and, and all kinds of other stuff. I think that's been, you know, discovered there, um, all kinds of stuff. And that's only just a fraction of whatever's left, you know, that was a, such a huge civilization that a lot of people don't realize that um, when those people left, you know, they took most of their stuff with them. So, so much was not left behind. So uh, it would have been very easy for people in the East that didn't have access to Osage to get Osage. And I think that there's, uh, I've got a very strong theory on that that uh, your best hunters in a tribe are probably going to have Osage bows. And when you have guys that are shooting bows like hickory or black locust or uh, cypress bows, it's they're learning, 
you know, it's before you get an Osage bow, oh, yeah. you, it's kind of mm -hmm. like a status symbol. You want to learn how to build bows? Well, you're not going to use this Osage bow that, that took three weeks to get, you know, this is, you're going yeah, to practice point. on this stuff. And so your best bow makers and your best bow hunters are probably going to be the ones that have these very coveted bows because why wouldn't you shoot them, especially when they're not affected by moisture as much and they just... 10 times not 10 times but it's a huge exaggeration it's considerably better performing bows i mean it could take the bow especially in the humidity that we have here in florida and if you if you're not constantly running dry cycles on it you can get 15 to 20 feet per second faster on the same length bow the same weight bow and the same draw length bow out of osage because wow. unless you're constantly baby now if you're constantly monkeying with it and drying it out you can make that hickory or that elm or or uh, locust or whatever you can make it shoot just as fast as that osage bow but it will eventually take on that moisture and lose quite a bit of uh of performance which is very unfortunate because i was hoping to to kind of prove that wrong but you know it is what it is it's i'm not concerned about uh you know trying to say i'm right or wrong on something i just want the data it's it is what it is it's just and, it, and then the french word for osage too is like bois de arc or something like that it's like the bow wood basically like yeah you, it's, it's <laughs> the wood of the bow is what of the bow that translates like, to yeah. yeah because that was so it just know, tells you how how good it was i mean if it's known as you know wood of the bow or just you know i mean yeah when the, when the french came yeah absolutely when the french came right yeah, so I'm sure it got around. Plus, if you look at, you know, map distributions of Osage, um, they they believe that it originated, it's truly native to like Eastern Texas, Arkansas, that kind of area. Mm -hmm. um, but as if you look at a map at where its distribution is now, it's got tons of these little pockets of it all over the East and even the West where it went West. Mm. And so I know a lot of it has been, you know, cultivated and used for fence rows, um, you know, for cattle for, but that's a relatively short amount of time in the grand scheme of things. Now, if you see a fence row made out of it, that's obviously done by, you know, farmers, especially right. in the Midwest. Um, but for the most part, the stuff in the East, it grows in these little pockets. And I do, I think that Indians quite literally brought seeds back and planted it for the future because there's very distinct pockets and where it grows. And a lot of it is, this is something I kind of hope to do a little bit more is I would love to see the correlation to these sites versus, um, you know, major civilization sites of early peoples and see if there are a lot of correlations there. But I mean, of course there are because there's so many of these little pockets around where it's not truly native to. And the people say, well, that's ridiculous. You wouldn't have any proof of that. Um, in contrast, you there are actually um, groves of Yapon holly that were planted um, in Appalachia. And that's not native to there at all. And the Cherokee actually brought that up because they used it for their tea. Um, you know, it has a natural caffeine in it. And that's also something that they were making, you know, like the warriors drink the black tea or the, the black drink from. And so that's native to down here in Florida is that Yapon Holly mm -hmm. and, you know, even Southern Georgia. And they realized that that was a good, a trade good. And so uh, the Cherokee brought that up and actually planted, you know, these like orchards of these trees to use as uh, you know so they actually have documentation of that that they were brought up and planted so if they were doing that for tea they were <laughs> certainly doing it for their bow wood, yeah you know? <laughs> exactly for sure yeah have you have you played around with you at all like pacific you yeah as a bow yeah. as a bow wood what, what do you think of that how does that compare is it a i mean probably not as good as osage or it's not it's overrated it's it's one of those i mean it can make a good bow i mean i'm saying it's not a good bow wood but you know people that say oh you is the best they're they're either leaning towards well that's because that's what the english chose for right. war bows over you know but that has a totally different context as well i mean that's that's about weight and travel and and uh there's a lot and ease of working and that kind of stuff. There was a lot more reasons to use you than it's just a superior wood, um, you know, in warfare archery. And so the use of wood, you wood in North America is, is 
relatively slight comparative to you know Osage or Hickory or Black Locust because it really isolated to the Pacific Northwest you know anywhere from um, you know Northern California up to you know Washington and so you're you know it's not like it's it's really widespread like all these other ones so there's you know more of a mountain growing wood per se I'm not saying it all grows in the mountains but it's like that's that's the typically the more sought after stuff and so I've well I've made and and uh and hunted and killed stuff with yew bows and I do like the wood I would still choose Osage without a doubt and that's not I, I do have some yew information in the in the book as well but I don't have quite the the number of studies that I have on the other stuff but in preliminary tests testing like the humidity it also sucks up quite a bit of humidity as well which I was thinking it probably wouldn't but it it does at least by just putting a moisture meter on it I haven't taken the feet per second data off of it and I'll do that for the second edition but I got to get this first edition up and out first and then we'll go back make some you know slight corrections as we need it and then add more content especially for you know western bow wood type stuff I mean, I'm busy enough with the Eastern stuff, but uh, if I keep just adding stuff to this, I mean, this book's already three years in the making. We're never going to get this thing done. It just keeps growing <laughs> and it's yeah. not getting any closer to being published because I got, uh, I keep adding so much to it. I mean, it's already going to be a big book, but in preliminary tests, I don't see a need to, you know, to say that you would be better. Plus, I mean, you're talking about taking something all the way from the Pacific Northwest to make that travel route all the way to the east would be almost ridiculous now that's a, that's a very long way to start traveling with mm -hmm. you know luckily osage grows right in the middle of the country so, right. so it's kind of everybody can kind of get it but uh yeah and for a sub you know realistically a subpar wood compared to osage nobody's going to choose hickory over osage if they have it nobody's probably going to choose you over osage if they have it once you've worked enough you and enough osage you're going to choose osage unless you just love you because that's what you is and you just it's just something that you love mm -hmm. uh, same with hickory there's people that are like nope i just love hickory and that's what i want to use and it's like cool go for it but it's definitely not not the best uh which is very ab abundant in the east and southeast so yeah you know, plenty of it yep exactly easy to find grows straight and people certainly used it but i do believe that the the best the best hunters had access to osage and for your own personal arrows what, what are you using river cane without a doubt is by far the best i've done so much um hunting with both river cane and natural hardwoods like doweled arrows to me don't even qualify as primitive so when you talk about like porter ford cedar or fir shafts or something like that i mean you make arrows and more traditional base but like true yeah. primitive arrows you got to go into the woods and you know cut little sapling shoots and then turn those into arrows and they make some beautiful arrows and they can be very heavy uh which is kind of good and bad you know depending on the context you're using it but uh they're just not as consistent and you can make you can make a set very consistent but humidity affects them a lot too so as they which woods are, are we talking which which or the cane are you talking cane or, or hardwoods hard or softwood woods. hardwoods okay hardwoods yeah so you'd be looking at um red oak, your dogwood arrowwood viburnum and sparkleberry primarily mm -hmm. you know are going to be your best options and you get stuff like wild rose and there's some just offshoots button bush and and um I mean, elm shoots, I mean, there's all maple, I mean, there's all kinds, if you find a hardwood shoot, they pretty much act about the same. Around here, sparkleberry is very, very popular, and and uh, arrowwood viburnum, and then you get start getting a little bit more north, and you start shooting for more like red osier, um, but overall, once you've, it's kind of like using all these other bow woods, once you get a hold of Osage, you choose Osage. Well, once you get a hold of River Cane, you use River Cane. It's just, <laughs> it, it's, it's so much better in, in many ways. It just rebounds faster out of the oscillation, um, which most people call paradox, which isn't really isn't a paradox. That's, it's not a great definition of that, but people, you know, having it, when you say Archer's paradox and they think of the arrow oscillating back and forth, it's not actually a paradox, but that's a, that's what people know it as. But that oscillation, the more, the longer that it bends back and forth like that because of the initial inertia from when it's let go, 
the more energy is taken out of the arrow. So you want it to recover very fast and start flying straight. And so river cane does that. It comes out of that oscillation exceptionally fast. And, uh, and it's very, very tough, very tough. And, uh, and uh, one of the, probably the best, most important things about it is when it grows in an area, there's hundreds of cane shafts, you know? So it's like, you, once you've got a grove of this cane, which was very abundant, especially back then, a lot of it's been purposely destroyed, you know, for crops and crop fields and, uh, and cattle have, have been very hard on cane, native cane. They say that 90% of the cane that was uh, growing in America is now gone because of, of cattle and uh, agriculture. And so the, we don't have a whole lot of uh, the cane ecosystem anymore, uh, at, at least so they say, uh, which I, I do tend to believe it is actually kind of a fragile uh, ecosystem compared to like bamboo, which you plant boo, bamboo, the stuff goes absolutely crazy. Like you can't get rid of it. Yeah. And cane, cane, although it's related to it, it's basically a North American bamboo. It's not as, as hardy. And so you can actually kill it. If you're a little bit too hard on it, you you can kill it. And if you dig it up and pull the runners out, it's it ain't coming back. Unlike bamboo, you take one little piece of bamboo and drop it, and you know five years later you got a bamboo forest on your hands. So, <laughs> um, yeah, it, it really has been destroyed. But when you have a stand of cane, you've got almost an unlimited supply as this stuff grows constantly. And if you just take care of it and you don't just like cut it all down or destroy the root system, the stuff will grow indefinitely. And the, almost the more you cut it, the more of it'll grow. And there were Spanish explorers that had written in journals that sometimes these cane breaks took days to actually get through because they wow. were so dense and they learned to avoid them at all costs because that's they would they were getting into snakes really bad and that was also where a lot of the indians would ambush and we were in these cane breaks because it was so hard for them to maneuver around with all their gear they were carrying around um but once you've got these stands you're covered with with cane shafts and they grow very quickly now when you're looking for hardwood you got to walk around the woods and actually look for this and it takes you know a couple years for these little saplings to turn into good arrow shafts and so you know if they've got a little crook in them they don't straighten as easy as cane does so cane's just superior in so so many different ways now for your your personal hunting arrows is it just a straight piece of river cane with with the the point hafted on the end or do you put a a four shaft on it or I don't typically do four shafts. I mean, I've done, I've, I've killed a lot of stuff with four shafted arrows because I like to test stuff out, but the juice isn't worth the squeeze. You know, everybody says, well, you're going to increase the FOC if you put a four shaft in it. And it's actually not true. <laughs> um, we put, <laughs> we, we did a lot of tests on that yeah. because if, you know, if the arrow is, is 30 inches, if you put a four shaft in it, all you did was lengthen the arrow. You know what I mean? So, yeah. if, but if you make it overall 30 inches and you put a four shaft in it, all you really did, did was replace the cane with a piece of wood and you put a small plug in the bottom. And so all you've actually done is add about 20 grains to it overall, but you also made a weak joint where the, that four shaft meets the main shaft. That joint is actually weak. That's the weak link in the arrow now. Mm -hmm. And so you can actually gain a little bit of weight per se, but if you truly want to maximize the benefits of having a four shaft, you taper that four shaft down to have a very, very small point. Well, what happens is your four shafted arrows actually come out lighter than mm. it would be if you would have just left the whole thing cane and then just filled the last, the last uh, um, calm chamber, you know, the inner nodal chamber with wood or more skewers of, of cane to make it solid and then taper that down. So it's kind of interesting where we make these arrows. Like I specifically, even in the book, as I took these, these shafts that um, were full length shafts and I filled them with like removable plugs so I could get all the data off of building the arrow without using a four shaft, then cut it off and make a four shaft taper the four shaft down to where it fits really nicely and it, you, it, it uses the benefits of the four shaft and then reweigh it and typically I lost weight by adding the four shaft which people would say well that's ridiculous that doesn't make sense and it's like but once you see how the process works you'll also mm -hmm. you'll, it's easy to see how you're like oh yeah I see but that's not bad either even though you lose weight in the arrow you also um, lose resistance so it, if you have a very skinny 
yeah so yeah because that you we start to mitigate the the issues of that resistance or drag going into the animal and so you can get great penetration out of it in fact we've done everything from filling the internodal chamber with sand too, trying to get the foc up just to see what will happen and uh, what happens is is actually the lighter arrow that has the very very skinny like barrel tapered end um you know either just cane shaft or four shaft it doesn't really matter as long as it's tapered really skinny uh, will penetrate further than the heavier shaft that has more mass that's filled with sand because you can't taper it if it's filled with sand because the internodal chamber is full of sand and if you taper it you're thinning the walls of the cane and so mm -hmm. you have to leave the cane thick and so now you have a thicker shaft so it's a trade-off and what we see is the the benefits of the extra weight like the mass from you know the benefits of the kinetic energy and momentum are kind of trumped by the loss of the drag you know or the resistance in mm -hmm. penetration by having a skinnier shaft so there's there's been a ton a ton that has gone into this testing on you know what's the most efficient way to do it and a lot of it's just fleas on the dog it's it's neither really here nor there. I can kill a deer with any, I can fill the end with, with sand, put a stone point on it and go kill a deer. I can put a four shaft on it that's teeny tiny skinny down to nothing, go shoot a deer. Or I can just take a, a regular cane shaft, plug the end, put a point on it and go out and kill a deer. And I'm gonna kill the, all them deer just as dead. So it's kind of just splitting hairs a little bit. So if you're killing them just as dead with everything, the next next logical choice is to just go with with whatever one is the most simple easiest to make or so, yeah. shortest amount of time to make yep if it's effective yep. and you know if it works you know why complicate it humans love to overcomplicate. oh yeah <laughs> and it's like in the book i specifically am overcomplicating everything because i get a million ideas from people that are like oh have you thought about doing this and it's like yeah, I've been doing this, but you know, I definitely have thought about doing that. But it's kind <laughs> yeah. of silly at the end of the day. Or the idea is that you know, the idea of you know, if you add a four shaft to this, it's going to be so much better in FOC, and you know, so you're going to get all these benefits from doing this, and you should do this. And it's like actually, it's worse in FOC. <laughs> yeah, and most people don't like realize. Counterintuitive. That. Yeah, so it's like you have to just you have to do the so research and the testing. Exactly, you know, and you can sit around and theorize it all you want, and you can make you know, make stuff up and, and test one or two and might even replicate, you know, the results that you want to replicate. But if you're completely unbiased about all of these tests, which I, which I am, I don't really care to prove something one way or another. I just want to know the truth of it all. So everything that I test, it's like, I'm just building it to the best of its ability. And then I collect the data off of it. And the data is typically very surprising. And then you kind of feel like an idiot that you put so much time into something that you gain so little on or actually lost performance on by putting more work into it you just improved it right to death <laughs> yeah so um in terms of points then we talked uh bow wood arrow shafts points what's your what's your go-to for hunting florida say typical florida animals um a little bit bigger stone point actually than what's contextually used just a little not a lot you know like maybe 60 to 70 grains you know 80 grams would be tops um smaller points but penetrate better again it sounds counterintuitive because of the whole foc idea but resistance and this is this we've absolutely proved many times over not just in in you know testing around the shop but actually you know going out and shooting a lot of animals <laughs> with them that we get a lot better penetration with smaller points because of the decreased resistance um so, but when you're shooting like, you know, Florida deer or hogs or something like that, I don't mind having a little bit bigger point because, you know, it's going to give me a little bigger wound channel and it's so thick around here. But I also have the luxury of, you know, having grain scales and a chronograph. So I know exactly what my stuff shoots. So I can actually, you know, eke out a little bit more performance out of stuff by tweaking it where early people didn't have that. They just made it, they went and hunted and they, you know, it, they just, it is what it is. And, you know, we've killed a lot of animals with very, very small points, you know, from say, I would say right around 12 grains up to 30 grains. Wow. We've killed quite That's, a that few. That light, incredible. Yeah. And shooting through them, you know, really without a problem, you know, both me and, and uh, my buddy Vastin Hall, he's, he's killed, uh, you know, quite a few in one summer, quite a few hogs he went out with. I just kept making them arrows with these little points. And I was like, just go 
go shoot everyone that you can get as they're trying to do hog control on on the ranch that's just never-ending amounts of hogs so they would go down and he would be shooting these hogs all the time and testing them out and seeing how it works and it's amazing you take these just teeny tiny points that are the size of your fingernail and you run it through the lungs of a hog and it's dead it's dead just as fast as anything else it doesn't go very far so and it just really goes to show that when you look at the archaeological record the points that they were using were on true contextual arrow points or very small points the larger points people find are are at lateral points you know they're on spears you know which is pre you know let's call it 2000 years ago there's a transition between the at lateral and bow and arrow which i won't get into in this i do in the book but not not here um but you're talking you, you've got 10 10 to 15,000 years worth of atlatl technology verse you know one to two thousand years of bow technology so there's so many more atlatl points and then also what people are calling either atlatl points or spear points a lot of them are knife blades that are knife just blades. exhausted yeah. yeah they've they're either full knife blades that they find and it's a big one but it's shaped like a point because it's but it's just a diagnostic lithic that's just shaped like whatever style is is uh, common in that region in that time frame but they use them both for knives and for projectiles and typically what you do is you make a projectile or you make a blade as big as it can possibly be made from that piece of stone and if it's too big for a projectile to be efficient you use it as a knife you know as a saw you know you cut wood with it you cut bone with it you you know cut animals with it it's a kind of a multi-tool saw slash knife and as you sharpen it, you chip the edge off, you know, to expose a new rock. Mm -hmm. Well, as you chip that edge, you're making that that blade smaller and smaller and smaller. And so once you've kind of exhausted it down to where now it's, you know, kind of a nub and it's not so good for cutting. And now you just go ahead and make yourself a new knife blade. Well, your old knife blade either gets discarded on the ground or and then and then we find it or it gets slightly reworked and used as a spear point, depending on how common uh, rocks are in the area good napping rocks if you have a place that's just like edwards plateau in texas that's absolutely covered with rocks they'll throw perfectly good blades on the ground because instead of just sharpening them to death they'll just make a new one you know so they mm. are quick to get rid of them it's not that big of a deal where you take a place like north carolina that is very rock poor they'll use everything they have right down to an absolute nub because they they really traveled quite a distance to get it so they'll utilize everything start with a knife work it all the way down to you know a spear point and then they'll sharpen that steer, steer spear point down till it's almost nothing and uh, it's either broken or it's you know almost junk that they're just trying to force through something so you know that stuff varies per per region and available resources and stuff but and we're talking shirt mostly or, or different different rock yeah i mean it's all it's all mostly related for the most part like there's so many different types of chert in america mm -hmm. but you could you could ball all that up with the exception of obsidian you know being all yeah. volcanic glass which you know is is only in in the west you know in the more volcanic regions or extinct volcanic regions um you know everything in the east is either you're looking at uh, chert jasper and you know some agates and you know like chalcedony which is just a purified chert essentially and agate is more or less a purified jasper if you you know start splitting hairs on stuff and then some extra rare stuff which you know occasionally there's like an opalite type of thing or i know there's something in florida that's along that it's like a florida opal or opalite i'm not sure the difference between the two but it's a kind of an odd stone but for the most part the composition is all the same it's just silica that's uh that's settled and mm -hmm. has a lot of pressure behind Under it pressure. You know, oddly enough the uh um you know it's a sedimentary rock which is odd but it's it's just it forms differently than your sandstone type of sedimentary rock that everybody's used to and oddly enough you know the, the all this rock that's in the that's in the east especially down like florida and georgia um was from the Appalachian Mountains when the Appalachian Mountains were much bigger when they were the size of the Rocky Mountains at one point you know they were big you know and so all of this granite has eroded over a period of time and it's uh, it's all it's all almost pure silica and so it's been washed down uh, through river systems and then when Florida was covered with a sea it was like you'd have rivers that emptied into the sea of what is now Florida and 
that's what it's like having you ever see like the pictures of where the Mississippi and dumps out into the Gulf of Mexico mm-hmm. where it's yeah. like these giant mud, you know, like it's just mud everywhere right. around it Delta. because of that. Yeah. So it's the same thing. It's all this, all this silica sand mud that's washed down from the Appalachian mountains eroding through the river system and then washes out into the sea of that's where all florida's beach sand is it's that's the appalachian mountains just broken so, down yeah that and shells you know that have been tumbled over and over and over but the shells are basically just repurposed sand you know the animals take the sand and make it in shells and then but that's where it truly comes from so the geologists say i wasn't alive back then i didn't see it but that's that's what they say you might have been <laughs> what's that <laughs> You might have been around to see it. I, I was there. I can <laughs> verify that is true. <laughs> yeah. Interesting geology, you know, and how that all kind of comes to be that that's the reason we have all the arrowheads and stuff that we have around us because we have the Appalachian Mountains that used to be, you know, they, I think yeah, the, somebody even said they were the size the of the Alps. Yeah. Wow. They used, Incredible. They used to be the size of the Alps at one point. Big yeah. Where I, race. where I hunt with uh, Dalton Lewis up in North Carolina, we, we hunt near the new river. It goes right, right next to one of his, one of the properties we hunt. And that's the second oldest river on earth. Yeah. Wow. The new river just, you know, just goes to show, you know, the Appalachians have just, um, yeah, it's a horrible ancient, name ancient... for that river. <laughs> yeah, <I know>. yeah. <laughs> Does it <make> any sense? <laughs> I mean, it's called the second oldest river, not the new river. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I gotta, yep. I gotta read up on that, why that is, but it's pretty funny. <laughs> Everything's new yeah. river, this new river, that. New River Brewing. I noticed that right away. Yeah. The, the brewery. But um, <laughs> so we've touched on uh, quite a bit in terms of your gear. Um, you want to talk the the meat aspect of it, the hunting, the harvest. I hate to use that word, but the the kill after after the kill. What If you had to, this is another one of Marcy Lisa's questions. If you had to choose uh, or for your family, a, a game, wild game meat, what's their favorite? What's your favorite? Um, do you have one or is it just depend? Um, I would say, I mean, hey, historically, <laughs> historically, it's always been uh, deer. Uh-huh. Um, but, you know, the, the oddly enough, the kids have taken quite a uh, shining to, to hogs, which I've, ne- I've never been a huge fan of, um, but they like it if I pressure can it. And then we'll, you know, bust it up and either use it for, you know, like pulled pork stuff, or they really like when we do like black beans and rice and then mix the pork in with yeah. it, and put hot sauce on it. And that's, you know, that's pretty good. It's an easy, quick, easy meal. It's not one of my, it used to be a favorite until I ate too much of it now, but, but deer has really stood the test of time and uh, the younger, the better. So, I mean, you know, spikes and, you know, button bucks out that every day of the week, man, I would love that. Um, oh yeah. You know, I'm, I much prefer the the meat over the antlers anyway. So I would be very happy to shoot young deer every single year. Um, I would have no problem doing that. That's one of my favorites. And then, you know, after the bison hunt, um, we didn't really like the bison to begin with because we were trying to experiment on how to cook it because it was a little bit different. We didn't treat it like normal beef. I mean, it wasn't like deer. You almost have to figure out how to do it all on its own. And so learning that process and, and grilling it made a big difference. I didn't think, you know, a lot of times if you grill steaks and stuff, you can run the risk of them being, you know, dried out or tough or right. something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but just like a, a, a quick hot grill type of sear, you know, really was the way to go on on that. And of course, about the time that we really figured it out, like really figured it out and we were enjoying it, it was about all gone, you know, so we were taking, you know, a lot of these steaks that would have been just, you know, prime backstrap steaks out of the bison, and we didn't like love them and tried to do them in the pan, and we didn't love them, we tried to broil them, we didn't love them, um, and we just end up throwing them in the crock pot, just cooking them down, you know, to just make it, you know, and then eat it with, you know, some sort of sauce or something, but still just didn't love it, and then, of course, about the time that we finally figured it out, it was about all gone, but, uh, no. <laughs> you know, bison's kind of the way to go, so, I'll be looking forward to, uh, you know, getting some more of that someday. How about bear meat? Have you had that before? Yeah. I hear mixed yeah, reports I, on that. Um, I didn't have any issue with it. Uh, it. It was pretty darn tough to just make uh, steaks and stuff out of. So, you know, if we threw it in a crock pot, it was, it yeah. was great. It was no, you know, most things are you crock pot it long enough. You, you could eat a shoe. 
Um, but, you know, I would even pressure Canna Bear, and I think that would be great. But, you know, I'm not opposed to the stakes either. They're just probably going to be a little bit more tough because you can't just leave them rare. You know, you have to worry about, you know, trichinosis with bears, right. the same God, as you yeah. do hogs and stuff. So last thing you don't, know, you, you have to kind of cook them to death and you do that. And then that's when it turns into, you know, tough, tough meat. So, you know, probably crock pot and a bear was the best way to go with that. And, uh, you know, I wish we could, wish we could shoot bears in Florida. Cause I, uh, I would definitely be interested in going and doing more of that. I know we can do it in Georgia, but getting the, the place to do it, um, you know that's a possibility in the future too i may just get a lease just so i have a place to go but it seems almost silly to do that just for bears if i really want to shoot a shoot more you know bears i'll just go on a trip but mm -hmm. it's more fun when you do stuff on your own and then of course the elk's phenomenal elk meat's wonderful um is that so your favorite fun. is that your favorite the elk um maybe you know and it's been years since i've had pronghorn too but having um pronghorn was really really good as well so i you know to me it, I, I don't think it matters too much between deer elk pronghorn i think the elk was better than the deer i really do um but you're kind of splitting hairs a little bit too because you take the best cut of the deer is probably going to be worse than the or better than the worst cut of the elk you know and obviously vice versa but uh you know any of that kind of stuff deer any of them plant eaters i'm, I'm happy to eat any of them deer elk pronghorn, <laughs> a calf um, a calf bison. elk would be like the world class i think <clears throat> i bet it would be i've yet to shoot a calf elk but i would i would love to do it <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> we have make make these trips where i just want to go hunt and be like yeah i'm just hunting calves you know <laughs> <laughs> draw a calf tag that's right yeah yeah like, yeah, we oh, talked about it run for a bull again <laughs> yeah, <really. laughs> oh, i'm yeah. seeing our bulls this sucks mm -hmm. yeah I, we've talked about that before like you know the the meat is a trophy and uh and the experience of course but um yeah, yeah. when i see people posting like apologizing for deer for that was my first trad kill just a small yeah. sp sp i was like what are you talking about i even commented today on something like Dude, you just shot world class venison right there. That's as good as it gets. Yeah. A spike buck or, you know, a young doe or, you know, button buck. Just, yeah. yeah. Well, well, the TV started to make, you know, obviously they've impacted a lot with everybody's a trophy hunter now. And there for a little while, I don't remember what shows it were, but they were like, where everybody's saying that, you know, these younger deer are better to eat. They're like these older deer, these old mature bucks are just as good and tender and delicious as the young ones. And that was like, in my head, I was like, obviously they're saying this because they're really trying to promote growing the antlers and it's okay because you can get great meat out of them too. Or it was people saying that that clearly haven't eaten enough spikes and button bucks yeah. and young does to know how phenomenal that meat is and it is there is a taste difference there absolutely, absolutely is for sure because they're not they're not full of testosterone um so absolutely the taste is better and sure you can doctor stuff up to taste better if that's what you want to taste is whatever sort of sauce you put on it but it's not just the taste it's the it's the quality it's the tenderness of the meat is hands down in the favor of the younger deer. I mean, you take a, a button buck or a, a yearling doe or a spike or, you know, a year and a half old doe, those are the absolute best eating deer you're going to get. And the older they get, the, you know, the little tougher it kind of gets. And I mean, you can still cook it certain ways to make it better. Like anybody say, well, you take an old buck and put him in a crock pot, he's still going to be delicious. And it's like, well, that, that is true if you like crock pot deer. But if you want to talk about taking, making really nice steaks, and you want to grill steaks it's that's night and day difference you can't take an old an old doe or an old buck and have the same quality tender steaks that you would you know out of a young one and it's no different than you don't go you know to the to the cattle butcher and say uh i want um a nine-year-old bull <laughs> to eat that's true. i mean it's just yeah it's, you don't nobody do does that. that no and there's it's a reason you know and it's the same thing with with deer it's like you know can you make it palatable sure you know but that bison i killed was a you know a mature bull and and there were certain ways that it was like this is like not just 
not great to eat it was bad to eat it's like okay we don't do this again like we're literally going to drown this in some sort of sauce so we can eat it um and then we moved on and it was like we should have never shot you know this bowl but you know that's you know the the direction we end up taking things sometimes we take the one we get but also you know it was i wanted to see what kind of penetration we get on a big one plus you know everybody does you know they want to shoot the trophy kind of thing and and the cows were pregnant at the time so it was kind of limited you know, oh, I as see. to what I could do. So, yeah. So, but you know, I, th I thought that was kind of a one-time deal. And so I wanted to make sure I got something that, you know, I didn't want people to say, oh, well, yeah, you killed a, you killed a young calf or, you know, you killed a cow or something like that with an atlatl. You wouldn't have been able to do that to a bull. Well, they go out and kill a bull and now nobody can say that, you know, That's now true. in the future, you know, I go and shoot something, I can go shoot whatever I want. And if they say I can't do it, I'll say, well, I already, I already, I already did it, you know, and this would mm -hmm. be you know, but now I win because I got the better meat. And then so. the primitive cultures would have just been shooting the first thing they could get. I mean, they weren't right. If it was a calf or there was no consideration, I assume, for, um, you know, whether it's a big bull or a cow or bison or calf bison. No, and I would even go as far as to say they would specifically try to not target the bigger the big bulls. Ones. Yeah. yeah, just because there is there is a more of a danger issue with trying to kill a big bull plus penetration plus the quality of the meat. If the goal is to maybe get, you know, if you're maybe needing hides, you know, talking plains bison uh, and plains Indians, if they're trying to get hides to make teepees or something like that, then I could see going and actually targeting the biggest ones because you want the biggest hides possible. That makes sense. Yeah. But for the most part, when you're talking about table fare, and you're you're talking about throwing a bison down that's big so even a calf has quite a bit of meat on it oh yeah you're gonna get you're still getting a lot of meat and you have to be able to process this animal out and use it now if you have a, a very large village you know or you know, nomadic or semi-nomadic or whatever you go you know kill a few of these things where well, you're going to eat them up pretty quick anywhere at least have enough hands to process it out dry it out and preserve some of this but it's almost easier especially in your super early nomadic cultures where you know they're not really bow hunting per se this is like early paleo stuff where they're walking by foot and following you know herds of animals especially when you're talking like mastodons and mammoths that kind of stuff that they're targeting the little ones because now they're going to kill whichever one they get the opportunity at, but it's easier to kill the little ones because little ones are dumb and smaller. So if you get an opportunity to kill the small one and then it's less to work because um, you're going to lose that meat anyway. So, you know, you're not going to, you're not out trying to trophy hunt or kill the biggest ones because now it's, it's tougher to cut through them. And, you know, sometimes the resources aren't as good. If you're looking for true hide quality, a lot of times your younger animals are better for making stuff like clothing. You know, you take a, a, a big bull bison that's got this heavy skin and it's not very pliable skin. It's very, very thick and it's very heavy. Uh, if you were actually going to use it for clothing material, you know, shooting a calf is probably the, one of the best way to go as well. So, you know, you just opportunistic for the most part. Now, I feel like especially deer hunting, it's opportunistic. You just shoot whatever deer you get in front of mm -hmm. you you know with bison i actually think you can be a little bit more choosy and say what are we you know there, there's a herd of them what are we gonna go what are we gonna go after today because they're not as flighty you know as deer deer see you and he's gone you know bison see you and they stand there and look at you and you can you know they will run when you get close enough to them but um i'm assuming probably back then they were even more docile to a degree until you got them started then like anything else you get them started now you got to stampede on your hands but um you know, it's hard to even speculate. even animals. I mean, even predators, predators like lions, they're going to mm -hmm. and bears, you know, they eat a lot of a lot of um, elk calves and stuff. Calves, yeah, always... yeah, calves and fawn deer fawns. And they're going to take the easiest route. I mean, oh, yeah. And, you, know, you know, prides of lions in Africa, they're, they're trying to find the youngest, dumbest zebra in the herd and they single it out. And that's yeah, yep. just easier to catch. And there's your food. There's your, yep. your meal. Or or old and sick, kind of the same. Or old thing. and sick, yeah. And mm -hmm. it's like I can imagine if you were following around a bison and you got an, you know, an, an old bull. You know, you might be looking at him. Ah, he's easy when he's going to suck to eat, but you know, he's easy kill, and we're going to do it. Or, you know, ideally, you know, maybe it's you know you find that that one that's injured. I mean, stuff gets injured all the time. You oh yeah. Know? Especially in those big herds, you get a lot of stuff moving around. So you get one that's got a limp on it, and uh, and it's starting to 
lose body mass, you know, and it's having a hard time keeping up, it's going to tire out a lot faster and there might not be quite as much meat on it per se, but it's easier kill. And you just go over there and, you know, shoot it or spear it and, and uh, it doesn't matter. It's not like you're paying for the pound of it. You know what I mean? It's, mm-hmm. it's just the meat. So, and the other resources you need from it, sinew and hide and all that kind of stuff. So it doesn't hurt too much if it's, you know, a little bit shy on meat. I mean, dang thing's a bison. It's still going to have lots. Oh yeah. <laughs> so we're, Ryan, we're right at about a, just over an hour. Um, you want to talk about, uh, do you have a, a most memorable hunt? I can't think I might, well, maybe I don't know which one you'd choose. Just the most memorable, uh, one just stands out the most to you or one of the most, doesn't have to be the most, but what do you think? You know, I don't know. It, it would be really hard just, to Or just pick one. one, just pick a story that you, um, you think. Well, they, they mean different things in different ways. Like the, the elk hunt, I didn't have to work quite as hard for the elk as I have in many other ways. That was, we just really kind of got lucky on that, you know, public land in Idaho and then showed up, flew in that morning, exhausted, drove out to the mountains, hunted for a couple hours. And I got an arrow in one that night. It's like that just, you know, now I had to work hard to recover it yes. um, and then pack it out and that kind of thing. So that was, that was actually, it took longer to do that than it did to shoot to dang elk. But you know, to go onto public land with a stick bow and shooting cane arrows and stone points and to walk out with a five by five bull on public land is insane, realistically. Um, and the adventure of it was neat. I do feel a little bit robbed on not getting to get the full adventure. But uh, I mean, that that's a kind of a first world problem, you know, to be successful and kill a bull. <laughs> yeah, really. And then to Modern say, hunters. And then to say, well, I got robbed of the experience. It's like, yeah, I'll take that experience any day. Oh, heck yeah. Um, um, so that one. And then, of course, you know, the when I uh, atlatled the bison, it's not like it was the, it wasn't so much the challenge of the hunt. It was, it was definitely tougher than I thought it was going to be. But what that bison represented far more than anything else was hitting a new level in both business and what I was setting out to do that got me working with universities, you know, multiple universities, not just Texas A&M, um, that opened a lot of doors that was also to be able to afford to put on a production like that coming from, you know, building bows and arrows for a living and not really having any money that showed me, um, that I could turn it into real business and that I was able to make enough money to do this and not, not be strapped for money, you know, afterwards. And that was a a big production. I mean, we had, you know, realistically, by the time it was all said and done, not just the bison, but the whole production film, you know, rights to music and, and all the other things that go along with it, um, airfare to go to the university and do stuff. And, um, you know, probably somewhere between ten and twelve thousand dollars wrapped up into the whole thing, and it was like to be able to afford to just go do that. That was the start of something so much bigger. And so it's not so much like the hunt, as much as what the bison represented for not only business but also um, the capability of of doing something like that. So that's a that's a really big one. And then of course, you know, the first uh, first deer I ever killed, and uh, you know, with a bow, and then obviously you know first stone point experiences and that kind of stuff there's there's lots of them and a lot of them are on film i mean a lot of you've we've filmed a lot of them you have yeah. or i've been on a couple of them the yeah. uh atlatl oh, the, the atlatl Atl- pig the <laughs> atlatl pig that, that you did that's still one of the very top ones because we thought that it was never going to happen like that it was the silliest idea ever to go out and try to atlatl a hog and then somehow you know we just did it i mean we were already given up and it was so hot and miserable that morning. And I <laughs> yeah, was we're like, doing this in June in South Florida. So yeah. yeah and years you know, ago. remember, remember I came down totally committed. I didn't even bring a bow. You know, a lot of times yeah, you know, people are right. bow hunting or something, they bring a gun and they're like, well, if I don't get one by the last day, I'm going to gun hunt. And, and, you know, there for a while when I was wanting to atlatl hunt and bring an atlatl and then, you know, I'd have the bow and, you know, when you get tired of chasing them around, you'd be like, all right, well, I'm going to take the bow out. Cause it's hard enough shooting stuff with a bow, like, you know, really yeah, hard for sure. know, times. So the outlet will just seemed impossible. And I'm committed. I came down and we hunted and there was not a bow in the car. It was, it was at or bust. And, uh, just the way that that worked out, saw that pig out, you know, kind of rooting around feeding and then it disappeared. And we just kind of walked through that 
overgrown bamboo jungle with the with the apes in the background from that ape farm there or that ape like uh sanctuary yeah, that chimp, that was way, yeah, chimp could, sanctuary yeah yeah and it was way down the road but you could hear them you know screaming and carrying on even in the video it was kind of funny it was very junglish yeah and uh <laughs> totally i wonder if unrelated. people think we had to put that in but it wasn't it was really it was actually yeah. happening yeah it was funny uh so far away but you know sound just carried in that in that morning setting you know yeah and uh to you know to to get through all that bamboo and and it was like all of a sudden it was just there and you could see all the the grass was shaken you know remember in the video you you point at your nose like you could smell the pigs they were so close to us oh absolutely i was like closing the gap yeah yep and then stood and saw the grass shaking and was like oh wow it's right here and so i moved in closer and i remember just standing there with the atlatl up and ready for so long yeah it took for and my my arm was going numb you know for all the blood draining out of it and holding the spear up but you, you had to be ready you know for when it walked out and then when it did it was like an oh shit moment both for me and the pig it was like oh yeah okay it sees me and it's like uh-oh what is that and so it's just like you don't have a choice and it was close you know it was six yards or something like that it was stupid close and it was just a chunk of spear in it and and uh excitement after that couldn't believe that we pulled that off you know to i think that's the first first film of one actually being speared you know with an atlatl with a stone point you know some people had you know have i guess killed them you know with atlatls before there's some footage of that but nothing really good that was no. good solid footage and, and free first, and free range too yeah, yeah and free range yeah no bait you know just spot and stop yeah with a stone point, you know, in a cane, cane, you know, atlatl spear. So the whole thing was contextual. It wasn't, you know, any of the modern stuff and, uh, and to get it on film, to get such good film out of it was, you know, that was really a, a big turning point as well. So yeah, a couple of big moments for sure. Oh yeah. There's more to come. Yep. Yep. Hopefully, God hopefully willing. lots yeah. more. Yeah. So you want to talk about your contact info quick as we uh, finish up here? What's the what's the best way to pe- for people to follow you? Uh, Instagram Hunt Primitive, um, YouTube Hunt Primitive, uh, Facebook is Gills Primitive Archery slash Hunt Primitive. After we kind of rebranded, a lot of people still know me as Gills Primitive Archery, so I kind of left that one up. Um, but pretty much everywhere else, it's just Hunt Primitive, and then of course HuntPrimitive.com, all one word. Um, you know, and on YouTube, I always tell people when you want to learn how to do stuff, when you're wanting to learn how to do like making bows or making arrowheads or any of this kind of stuff, you know, and you type into the search bar, you know, on YouTube uh, for if you said, oh, I want to make how to make an arrow or how to make a primitive arrow, people type that in, type in hunt primitive first. So okay. that way you, you'll definitely pull up up uh, my stuff first so you know exactly what it is you're looking at because uh there's a whole lot of stuff out there and there's there's some good videos that's not mine you know there's other people make good videos for sure but there's you you can wade through a whole bunch of crap and you don't know what's really true tried and you know true and, and really tested and proven out, so. yeah yeah so if you if you want to know how it's done that it we take it out into the woods and it really works i always tell people just type hunt primitive in front of it and uh then ask your question and hopefully something i got I don't know, probably 150 videos or so up on YouTube, maybe more. I don't know. So it's, there's a lot to choose from. So it's too much to just browse through. Best thing to do is type in what you're looking for. See if it pops up. Yeah. Cause I got a Mm -hmm. lot of, a lot of ideas and videos out there to help folks. So. Awesome. Well, Ryan, thanks so much for joining me. It's been fun. Yep. Absolutely. And I'll, I'll see you soon. Hopefully. Yeah, absolutely. Our next adventure. See you soon. Yep. Okay, buddy. Right, Hang on it. a minute. Okay. Mm-hmm. You got your game on, Kel? Put it on. I told you to put it on. Why didn't you? <laughs>